Hi, my name's Rich, and today we're going to be talking about the Wildfire Druid. It was added in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, and the word overpowered is often misused these days, so I'm not going to say the Wildfire Druid is overpowered, but it's definitely on the top echelon, the top tier of the subclasses you can choose for the Druid. It doesn't have any real weaknesses that I can tell. It can heal, it can deal damage, it can help out the party. It's one of the better all-round classes. In this video, I'd like to go over some of the abilities, some of the feats, and some of the races I would recommend for this subclass. Before we get started, I just want to give a quick plug. Uh, the Herbalist Ranger is finished now. Now, the Herbalist is a great way to buff up your party, to deal lots of damage, and, and it has a great way to tie in the Ranger's ability to scout the land and gather ingredients. I highly recommend you check it out. It's available to buy on the Kofi, or if you want to help support the channel, you can get it for free if you join the Patreon, link in the description. I'm currently writing a whole book of subclasses that uh, hopefully will be out for Christmas, and there should be one for each class, uh, 12 in total. I'll keep you updated on the channel as it progresses. But enough about that, let's crack on with the Wildfire Druid. The Wildfire Druid has three main roles in the party. It can be a fantastic healer, it can deal damage in a lot of its fire spells, and it has a pet uh, wildfire spirit as well. The wildfire spirit has to be tied to it to a certain extent, it can't go too far away, it's not as flexible as a familiar from the wizard's spell list. But uh, the wildfire spirit is really powerful in combat. The flame seed ability, it can deal damage from afar. With the initial summoning and the fiery teleportation, it can really pump out the damage and uh, manipulate the battlefield as well. All of this just for a bonus action, so you can still use your action every turn to cast spells or uh, do other things. The main advantage of this is that you're always using your action and your bonus action and you're always getting good value out of it. Sometimes with other subclasses for the druid, you're going to use your wild shape ability and then you're going to be dealing a little bit of damage or you're going to be running away and changing the battlefield's positioning, but you're not going to be able to do the two things at the same time. With the Circle of Wildfire, you can. I'd say one of the main downsides to the Circle of Wildfire is that it's fire damage. The fire is great for healing, it has a great thematic property, but in reality a lot of the monster blocks have resistance to fire, immunity to fire. It's one of the most resisted elements in the game. So in the first 5-10 to 10 levels, you're going to have a great time dealing lots of fire damage, but as you get higher and higher in the ranks, it's going to have diminishing returns. With one notable exception, you could pick up the Elemental Adept feat. This cancels out a lot of the negative aspects of you dealing fire damage, but uh, the Elemental Adept is one of the best feats I would recommend. Also, you could pick up Shadow Touched, which was introduced in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. Shadow Touched, it lets you cast Invisibility, and uh, it gives a boost to your Wisdom as well. To further supplement the Healer aspect of this subclass, I would also recommend the Chef and the Healer feats. You're not going to be able to pick up all of these feats without getting to a quite a high level, but I would say Elemental Adept first, then Chef or Healer, and then Shadow Touched. Quick side note, the chef is introduced in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, so if you're flicking through the player's handbook, you might not find it. Now, moving on swiftly, we're going to have a look at the, some of the races I would recommend. The classic from the player's handbook is the Hill Dwarf. It's one of the few races that actually gets a natural boost to their a wisdom. If we go further afield, the Furbolg is a good choice for Druid or Cleric. It does have a little flicker of invisibility as well, which helps in sticky situations. But uh, it's worth noting that if you want a strange contradiction of character, then the, the Water Gensai has a boost to wisdom. And having a Water Gensai casting lots of fire spells could be fun and interesting. And finally, the ultimate druid race has got to be lizard folk. They get the wisdom boost. They also get a natural AC bonus as well. You don't have to wear armor and it's uh, 13 plus your dexterity modifier. So that would give you some incentive to put some points into dexterity as well as your wisdom and constitution. Looking at the Circle of Wildfire's spell list, it is 
one of the best. Creme de la creme. It is. It has Cure Wounds and Revivify at 5th level as well. It has Burning Hands, Flaming Sphere, Scorching Ray. These are all great damage dealing abilities. Burning Hands at level 2 is a great area of effect spell and if you're fighting lots of gnolls or kobolds or goblins then this can take out multiple creatures at once. When you get further afield to level 7 for example, you get uh, Aura of Life and Fire Shield and Fire Shield really beefs up this subclass. One of the main criticisms is that it's less tanky than most druids because you don't get the wild shape ability to transform into a beast and have an additional health pool, but Fire Shield more than makes up for it. Finally, at level 9 you get Flame Strike and Mass Cure Wounds. Again, this is a testament to the strengths of this subclass, your healing and your dealing damage. They're both stellar spells and, to be honest with you, a lot of these spells you would end up taking regardless of which subclass you pick, so to have them built into the subclass is just a natural advantage. I'm struggling to find weaknesses. You could say that because it's a pet class, the natural weakness is that a smart enemy can try and take out your pet first and fairly weaken you, but I don't think that's going to be too much of a problem. The natural advantage of having a pet subclass is that you're going to be tying up a lot of uh, creatures with the uh, and I don't like using this because it's a little bit metagamey, but you're going to be tying up a lot of the creatures with the action economy. Well, enough talking about the Wildfire Spirit. Let's have a look at the stat block. You can summon it with an action and then you can move it around and tell it what to do with a bonus action, as per usual with a lot of these pet subclasses. The Wildfire Spirit itself, for a second level ability, a reasonable amount of hit points. This can diminish quite drastically over time. And the higher level you get, the the weaker the Wildfire Spirit is as a combatant. When you summon it, you can essentially use your flame use the flame seed as a great ranged ability. And for a bonus action, it does a reasonable amount of damage. It does get dark vision, which is kind of strange because it's a wreathed in fire, so if it's in the dark, it would be naturally giving off light. It's good to note that it hovers as well, so if you have like a, a chasm you need to try and traverse or uh, an invisible bridge then this can this can quite easily nullify the whole encounter. Just don't put it on any rope bridges because that might burn quite quickly. I think keeping it close to you but not directly beside you is the best option. And the spirit in an emergency can teleport you and people of your choice within 5 feet of it up to 15 feet so you can kind of jump out of the way of combat. Now, 15 feet is not going to get you out of combat range because they can run up and hit you again but it's still nice to get a disengaged and the extra fire damage is always a bonus. At level 6 it's just a straight boost, a straight d8 to your damage. Whenever you cast a spell when you restore hit points or deal fire damage, you roll in an extra d8. And you can use the Wildfire Spirit to cast the spell in lieu of you. So you could use the Wildfire Spirit as a, a medic of sorts, zapping it around the battlefield. And, and you can cast Cure Wounds at people without needing to be directly beside them. At level 10, you get Cauterizing Flames, which it allows you to take a dead creature's corpse and kind of turn it into healing for other people. Now, when you get bogged down with lots of enemies in a large-scale combat, uh, this can be quite helpful if you're fighting a one big creature, not so much. I think 2d10 and your Wisdom mod is a reasonable amount of healing. It's enough to just get people up and maybe take a hit afterwards. It is tied to a long rest and uh, limited your, to your proficiency bonus, so it scales up over time, so I think that's balanced quite well. And finally, at level 14, you get Blazing Revival. You can essentially have a phoenix down of sorts if you're a Final Fantasy fan. If the spirit is within 120 feet of you, and it should be because there's no reason for it to be that far away. You can regain half your hit points by sacrificing your spirit. And for a bonus action, this is pretty powerful. It's tied to once every long rest, but if you're going to be revivifying yourself and having half your hit points back immediately, you shouldn't discount this. It's wildly powerful. The fact that it's tied to half of your hit points means it scales up without question. So overall, if you want to play a druid that's more ranged and more support focused, healing focused, then Circle of the Wildfire I would recommend. I would recommend it over most of the other subclasses, but with the caveat of 
the weaknesses ball pet subclasses have and the fact you essentially need elemental adepts to keep up with everyone else. If you're not sure about the wildfire, you can always check out my Circle of Spores Druids video as well, which is quite an interesting one. And the plan for September, depending on the result of the polls, I'm going to be doing a Circle of the Flourishing Trees, which is essentially a subclass for the Druid, which is going to transform you into like a, a giant tree mech pilot. It's quite awesome, and I can't wait to show it with you guys. So if you're interested for more information, more details, then check out the Patreon, and there should be some updates there, and when it's released, I'll announce it on the channel. Well, thanks for watching, and I'll speak to you next time. Bye.